This is the Church of San Michele in Luca now, begun about a half century after the Cathedral of Pisa. The Cathedral of Pisa is, not surprisingly, in the style called Pisan Romanesque, and there are several other churches more or less in the neighborhood, including this one, that resemble it. The main thing that identifies the Pisan Romanesque is just the extensive use of columns as decoration. A bit farther away, however, we get to the Lombard Romanesque in the Cathedral of Modena, which you see now. Last quarter, we heard briefly about Countess Matilda of Tuscany, one of the most powerful Italian women of the Middle Ages, who presided at Canossa over the famous meeting between the Emperor Henry IV and Gregory VII in 1077. She paid for the rebuilding of this by the architect Lanfranco beginning in 1099, in commemoration of the fall of Jerusalem to the heroes of the First Crusade. Here you see the apse now, the east end of the church. Some of the things that are typical of the Lombard Romanesque are the dwarf galleries, small ornamental exterior arcaded passages that you can't actually walk around in. The columnless arcades and the flanking towers, too, are typical of the Lombard Romanesque. This is also very much the look of the Rhineland Romanesque in Germany, and of course, as we heard last quarter, the kings of Germany, aka the Roman emperors, took a big interest in northern Italy, well, in all Italy, and this might account for some of the architectural influence you see perhaps moving from Lombardy to Germany. The Countess Matilda's father, Boniface, had been created Margrave, that is, Count of Tuscany, by the Emperor Conrad II earlier in the 11th century. As I mentioned last quarter, there is very little sculpture surviving from the Middle Ages that is earlier than the 11th century. This representation of the story of Adam and Eve was made about 1100 for the facade of this church, the Cathedral of Modena, by a fellow named Willigelmo, or Guglielmo of Modena. But we're a long ways here from the technique of the Renaissance and the idealization of the human body we associate with it. It's worth noting for future reference, though, the way the hands of God and Eve are juxtaposed in the scene at the left, as though the spark of life were passing from one to the other. Michelangelo is, of course, most famous for using this motif on the Sistine ceiling. But although he made the most dramatic use of it, he didn't invent it. It was used by several artists before him, including Villagelmo here. These are really pretty dumpy looking people, though. You can just tell that Adam at the right here with Eve, who has sprung from his rib in the center, is going to do the wrong thing. He has one hand in his mouth and the other on his fig leaf. Duh, whatever you say, dear. That's right on the tip of his tongue, I think. Here's the nave of the Cathedral of Modena. The vault, incidentally, is 15th century, so ignore it for the present. One thing that also resembles the Rhineland Romanesque is the color of a lot of Lombard churches. Modena here is made of brick and Veronese limestone, which sort of varies from dark yellow to reddish in color like the limestone of western Germany. The raised choir with the altar is a feature you should also notice because they are typical of Italian Romanesque churches and rare north of the Alps. It's often suggested that there's a certain sort of zeitgeist, a spirit of the age, that is reflected in all the arts at a given time, and it certainly does seem as though the sculpture of Willigelmo, say, fits better with the architecture of the 11th century than with, say, the Gothic of the 13th or 14th. And it seems likewise that the plain chant you're hearing is sort of the musical equivalent to the Romanesque style. Doesn't Baroque music just seem to belong more to the atmosphere of Baroque architecture? and painting than it does say to that of the Romanesque? What about modern music, art, and architecture? Don't they seem to be a manifestation of the same perspective in different forms of expression? This is a view that 
can at least be defended, I think. This is another view of the interior of the Cathedral of Motored Up. I don't want to go too far into this, but music certainly can, of course, do a lot to create or destroy the right atmosphere for all sorts of things. Italian restaurants should play Neapolitan songs, not hip-hop. I'm reminded of the fellow who owned a shop in a mall in front of which angst-ridden teens were wont to congregate. To get rid of them, he just piped Lawrence Welk tapes out the window and they fled never to return. Wrong atmosphere. Speaking of Italian music, too, Luciano Pavarotti got his first singing job as a boy in the choir in this church, and I think Morella Franey's from Modern also. <laughs> Parma is northwest of Modena in Lombardy, and this is the cathedral complex there. The church was actually begun in the 11th century when the bishop was a fellow named Catalus, who lost his job for supporting Henry IV against the Pope in the controversy to which I've referred before. The man most famous in connection with this project, however, is Antolami, who was the architect of the late 12th century baptistry on the right, and an important sculptor as well, as we'll see. The Campanile here, the third member of the typical Italian cathedral triad, is late 13th century. Here's the facade of the cathedral up closer, and although this is in Lombardy, and I guess has to be called therefore Lombard Romanesque, all the columns are certainly reminiscent of Pisa. The decorative interlocking arches above the top row of columns there under the cornice is thought to suggest Moorish influence, at least that's a common motif in Islamic decoration, that, that uh, arcade of interlocking arches. We'll see it in Sicily in just a bit. And the zigzag pattern above them is a lot like the Norman zigzag. Both of these things, the interlocking arches and the Norman zigzag, can be found in Sicily, but this is a long way from Sicily. This is the crucifixion, actually the deposition in the south transept of the Cathedral of Parma, which was signed above the crossbeam there by Antolami. This is more or less contemporary with the tympanum at Alto in France by Gisobertus, which we saw last quarter, and which is considered the first signed work of French art. This is one of the earliest signed works of Italian art, though not the earliest. I wouldn't put too much emphasis on the signatures of artists anyway, though. Just knowing a man's name doesn't really tell you much about him. And a lot of the greatest works in the history of art aren't signed at all. Leonardo never signed anything. Michelangelo didn't sign the David or the Sistine Chapel or the Moses. As I mentioned last quarter, the crucifixion never became a popular subject in Eastern Christendom and didn't start to become popular in the West until the 12th century when this was done. I have no explanation for this. A lot of things that happen in the history of civilization are not really subject to any sort of quantitative analysis, at least that's convincing or persuasive, and it should simply be emphasized that they happen. A lot of art historians have made fools of themselves trying to sound like scientists. I may even have done this myself on some rare occasions, although I prefer to think of myself as a scientist trying to sound like an art historian. Here's Antolami's baptistry in Parma up close, and the thing you should notice here is the post and little colonnade. Although the round arch is considered the hallmark of the Romanesque style, it is in fact used in the majority of churches from late antiquity through the Carolingian and Atonian periods as well. This post and little stuff goes all the way back over all that. It's a throwback all the way to the Roman Empire and is almost a one-of-a-kind example in the 12th century. Here's the baptistry of which Antolami was the architect at Parma now inside, and it has important 13th century frescoes, but art historians focus here on the nearly freestanding figures representing the labors of the months, again by Antolami. The use of this theme, the labors of the months, along with the association of the signs of the zodiac with the months, 
which also became a popular tradition in church decoration, has always puzzled me a bit. And it became not just popular, but prominent. The usual overall explana explanation is just that it's a way of symbolically representing God's dominion over time and space, earthly activity in the heavens, but I think that leaves something out. I'd like to ask Andalami himself about this, or the guy who made the signs of the zodiac as prominent as the saints and angels on the facade of the Cathedral of Chartres. Here's the fellow representing September by Andalami with Libra. Although these figures are, in a sense, freestanding in that they aren't actually attached to a building, they have no backs. They are like very high relief reminiscent of some Egyptian sculpture. Sculpture did not really become an art form altogether independent of architecture the way it had been for the Greeks and Romans again until the 15th century. These figures by Antalami are sort of an exception to this rule, but since they aren't, as I say, carved completely in the round, one gets the feeling he was still looking at them from the point of view of a sculptor who thought of sculpted figures as part of something else. And they do have a little of the look of having been cut off of some wall and stood where they are. One of the most culturally diverse places in the Euro-Mediterranean Middle Ages was Sicily, which was a crossroads for Byzantine, Roman, Muslim, and Norman armies and influence. The Cathedral of Monreale here outside Palermo was begun in the 12th century as part of a Benedictine abbey by the Norman ruler of Sicily known as William the Good, son of William the Bad. The Good William's wife was Joan, the sister of Richard the Lionhearted, who visited here the Norman influence can be seen most obviously in the bell towers, which are part of the facade rather than freestanding. The interlocking arches in the facade decoration are, however, probably Moorish, Islamic in origin. This is the apse of the church, which also has these interlocking arches. The same Bananas who did the bronze doors for the Cathedral of Pisa came down here about five years later to do the ones at Monreale. The interior certainly doesn't look like anything in Normandy though. This is the kind of mosaic decoration one associates with Constantinople or with early Christian churches in Roman Ravenna. The kind of wooden timber roof you see here, sometimes called a trestle roof, was popular in Italy for centuries. Even some Gothic churches still have one, though many such churches, both Romanesque and Gothic, were eventually vaulted in stone, like the Cathedral of Modena we saw a few minutes ago. The late 12th century mosaics here, despite the fact that this medium is not considered congenial to realism, are more natural, I think, and impressive than most painting will be for another century. Here you can see part of the work above the nave arcade. Many of the earliest surviving Italian frescoes, as we'll see, are very reminiscent of mosaics, at this distance anyway. And many of the earliest panel paintings are also, contrary to what one might expect and suppose, very large, probably because of the influence of this kind of decoration. In Northern Europe, on the other hand, where mosaics and frescoes were not so popular, panel painting started off on a much smaller scale and was probably more influenced by manuscript illumination than wall decoration. The earliest well-known panel painters in Italy, people like Cimabue and Giotto, are known to have designed mosaics and to have also been fresco painters, while the earliest well-known panel painters in the north, people like Van Eyck, Jean Fouquet, never painted anything on a wall and were in fact themselves employed as manuscript painters. Here's the great mosaic of the Almighty at the east end of the nave, 
And again, the influence of the Byzantine tradition is probably seen in the emphasis on God as the ruler and judge rather than as the suffering savior on the cross, although the latter motif was hardly more popular in the West than in the East at this time. In any case, there are not many images in Western art that are more majestic than this. The cloister of the Cathedral of Monreale is one of the most impressive in Italy, and it has some very interesting columns decorated with images, symbols, many of which certainly challenge the imagination of scholars. This is the former Benedictine Abbey Church of San Zeno Maggiore in Verona. This is the first church we've seen that is not now a cathedral. This is a bit dangerous to generalize about, but in Europe as a whole, the Romanesque style is more well re represented by abbey churches like this one, while the Gothic style is more well represented by cathedrals. This is especially true as we saw last quarter in France and England, somewhat less so in Germany and Italy. In Italy, the Gothic style, as we'll eventually see, was not as popular as it was north of the Alps. So a relatively large number of cathedrals, like those we've seen at Pisa, Modena, and Parma, were never rebuilt in that style. The round or rose window in the front, west front here, though, may be, some think, the oldest surviving example of this sort of thing, and it did become a popular feature of the Gothic style. The round west window at Modena would seem to be at least as early, however. In any case, this church was begun in the early 12th century, and was essentially finished by around 1225. A piece of one of the abbey buildings survives at the left. The Campanile is at the right. It has no baptistry, San Zeno Maggiore, since it was built as the church of a monastery. Here's the interior now, which has the common Italian raised choir. The altar piece, you can barely make out in the distance, is the one by Mantegna, the San Zeno altarpiece by Mantegna, which we'll see up closer later in the quarter when we get to the work of Mantegna. The wooden ceiling here is 14th century. <laughs> This is another former abbey church at Fossanova, about halfway between Rome and Naples. Fossanova was begun in the late 12th century and is sometimes called the first Gothic church to be built in Italy, and it does have that rose window. But what makes it look Gothic on the whole to some people is, I think, mostly just the fact that it was Cistercian. The so-called Reformed Benedictine orders, Cluniac, Cistercian, and Carthusian, are represented in Italy, but with perhaps the exception of the Carthusian, these orders were never as popular there as in France, or north of the Alps generally. Italy would develop its own monastic orders in the late Middle Ages, and we'll hear more about them shortly. of Fossanova now, and this certainly could pass for a Cistercian Abbey in Burgundy, which was the heartland of that order. It has the flat east end, the pointed arches, and the overall simplicity of, or really lack of, decoration associated with the Cistercian style. But these characteristics are not enough to make it Gothic. It has neither the ribbed groin vaults, nor the large stained glass windows that are much more part of the style than just the pointed arch. And the flat east end is only really typical of the Gothic style in England, which was heavily influenced by Cistercian architecture. You can call Fasanova transitional, I think, if you want, but it's not Gothic in the full sense. come finally to Florence, which around 1100 was, according to Ferdinand Chaville, unbelievably poor and backward. This is a picture taken from the Abbey of San Miniato al Monte, which we'll see in a minute, but essentially nothing man-made in this picture was there in 1100, and well over a century would go by before very many things you see in this picture would begin to show up. 
The baptistry of the cathedral, which we'll see later, can count as an exception to this. It was there well before 1100, according to most accounts. But it underwent many changes over the centuries, and apart from it, the only other major building in Florence that would go back uh, to at least the 11th century is San Miniato itself, which was built during the episcopate of Bishop Hildebrand, not to be confused with the Pope of the same name. The Florentine Hildebrand was married and had 12 children, so his motive, I think, in commissioning the building of the abbey may have been to throw the abbey itself into the scales to balance his family, which he might expect to find on the other side come Judgment Day. Clerical marriage was on the way out at this time, still winked at a bit. In this picture now, you're looking back from Florence at the abbey itself. This was built in the early 11th century, even before the Cathedral of Pisa in all likelihood. It became a Cluniac Abbey, and if you were here last quarter, you may remember that the order favored heavily decorated churches, and you might suppose the facade of this church to be a manifestation of that, but in fact, this is just the general look of the Tuscan variety of the Italian Romanesque, which is distinguished by this kind of geometrical marble work. Hildebrand wanted to dedicate the church here to his abbey here to San Miniato, the only known early Florentine martyr, but unfortunately, his bones had been stolen by a German relic hunter. To get around this, Hildebrand announced that in a dream, he had been told that the stolen bones were really not those of San Miniato at all. And further, he said he'd been told where to find the real ones. And the bones of somebody were then dug up and pronounced by the resourceful bishop to be those of the real San Miniato. Moreover, he commissioned a fellow named Drogo to write a biography of the saint, which was easy because, as Cheville puts it, he had a mind above evidence, this Drogo. The biography concludes with the beheading of the saint, who then picked up his head and flew across the Arno to be buried where the bones were found on the site where the abbey now stands. While not a great work of either investigative reporting or literature, this biography is interesting as the earliest known work of literature by a Florentine author, nearly three centuries before the Divine Comedy. Here's the facade up closer. There's another good story connected with this church, which involves Giovanni Gualberto, the founder of the Vallambrosan Order. One day, Giovanni, at that time still a professional soldier, encountered an enemy, tradition says, right on the steps of the church. The swords were drawn, and Giovanni had his foe on the ground, ready to run him through, when the fellow spread his arms out in a way that reminded Giovanni of Christ on the cross. He underwent a sort of conversion experience then, helped the fellow up, and they both went inside to kneel in front of a figure of Christ crucified, which used to be in the nave of the church. Here you are now in the church, and that shrine there in the center of the nave marks the spot where this dramatic event occurred. The figure of Christ bowed off the cross to the two men, and Giovanni immediately vowed to become a monk. We'll hear more about Giovanni in a minute, but notice here the raised choir and timber ceiling again, and the use inside as well as out of the elaborate marble, marble were typical of the Tuscan Romanesque. The Apennines are very close to Florence, and it was up into these mountains that Giovanni now wandered in search of spiritual tranquility. For someone wanting to be a monk, there were lots of options in the 11th century, but Giovanni was only interested in the very ascetic orders. The Camaldulians of Camaldoli had been established around the year 1000 by St. Romuald, and they're still going today. There's a branch at Big Sur and some sort of Camaldulian place in Berkeley, I think. The Church of San Gregorio Magno in Rome, which we saw last quarter, is probably the most famous of their places today. Oh, 
Here you see part of the abbey as it does look today in the church. But only a small part of this uh, may go back as far as the 11th century. The Camaldulians were very ascetic. Like the Carthusians, they never spoke, lived in solitary huts, never ate meat, and so on. Some important people were to belong to this order, including St. Peter Damien in the 11th century and Gratian in the 12th. The former is famous as a severe reformer who criticized even chess playing by bishops, and the latter is considered the father of canon law. He sort of attempted to do for Christian law what Thomas Aquinas would do for Christian theology, harmonize and codify it. This is said to be the actual cell of St. Romuald at Camaldoli. And here outside you can see the huts of the monks. As ascetic as Camaldoli was, however, it was not what Giovanni wanted, and he wandered off to found his own ascetic order at Vallombrosa, which you see now. One of the most famous Vallombrosan abbeys was San Marco in Florence, which became Dominican during the Renaissance, as we'll see later. As at Camaldoli, most of the monks lived in a solitary state of sensory deprivation here, although by the time the big 17th century building you see was constructed, this order, like many others, had become much more lax. Despite the importance of people like St. Romuald and Giovanni Gualberto, though, when you think of Italian monasticism in the Middle Ages, one name has to stand out above all others, that of St. Francis of Assisi, founder of what became perhaps the most successful of all monastic orders. This is the church of San Damiano, a couple of miles south of the town of Assisi. Francesco Bernardone, a.k.a. St. Francis of Assisi, was born into a wealthy family in this town, Assisi, and until he was about 25, he lived a more or less normal life for someone in his socioeconomic subclass, even serving in the local army and then in the papal army of Innocent III. In bed with a fever at Spoleto, he thought he heard the voice of the Lord telling him to, in effect, return home and await further orders. Becoming more and more introspective and less and less concerned about things like business and soldiering, he took to meditating in this then ruined church where one day the Lord said to him, Francis, rebuild my church. And in the naive way that is certainly a large part of his charm, he began hammering and sawing and the Lord then had to clarify his command. No, Francis, not this church. I want you to rebuild the church. This led him to give up an interest in the usual worldly things altogether, to the point that in one of the most famous episodes in his life, he even took off all of his clothes and gave them back to his angry and uncomprehending father, as you see him doing here in one of the frescoes in the Basilica of St. Francis, attributed by many at least in part to Giotto. We'll hear more about Giotto next time, but the fact is that the farther you get from Assisi, the less often you find Giotto given credit for the Assisi frescoes. Several of the major American standard art history texts don't mention him in connection with them at all. There's little evidence apart from style to go on, however, and when that's the case, convincing argument, whether pro or con, can be difficult. In any case, to return to the subject rather than the artist, Francis now resolved to take the gospel literally. Call no man on earth your father. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, and so on. And amazingly, he got eleven other men to take this seriously, too. And in 1210, he went off to see Pope Innocent III, in whose army he had served, in hopes of getting his support for this new lifestyle change. This is the Assisi fresco depicting Francis before Innocent now. 
Innocent III was not the most spiritual of popes. He is, in fact, the one alleged to have said, I don't have time for religion. I'm the pope. Nevertheless, he was sympathetic to Francis and sponsored this new group called the Little Brothers, the Friars Minor, or as they came to be best known in a way that wouldn't have pleased Francis himself, the Franciscans. One of the most important things about this new order was the fact that its members would not wall themselves up or hide away from the temptations of the world in hopes of thereby increasing the chances of their own salvation in what could be argued was a sort of selfish way. The Franciscans and the Dominicans, founded in 1216 in much the same spirit, would rather go out in the world where the dangers were, where the temptations were, and attempt to save us, not just themselves. And this marks quite a revolution in monastic perspective. This is the Church of Santa Maria degli Angeli, just outside Assisi as it looks today. It is mostly late 16th century now, with a modern facade. Inside it is the tiny building preserved as a sort of architectural relic, which was given to Francis by the Benedictines to serve as a home, and where Francis himself eventually died, the so-called Porziuncula. There were certainly others before Francis who in effect argued that anything that didn't contribute to salvation was a dangerous waste of time, who argued that anything earthly must pale in comparison to eternal salvation. But the personality of Francis was such that many came to take this more seriously than they had before. <laughs> Here's the fresco in the basilica which depicts Francis preaching to the birds while his sidekick, prosaic brother Leo, Francis's equivalent to Sancho Panza, seems to be saying something like, oh no, he's talking to the birds again. It's not obvious to most Christians that Jesus really meant us to love animals as well as neighbors, but Francis certainly thought it was at least not inconsistent with the message of the gospel to do so. In fact, he regarded even some inanimate things, like the sun and the moon and water and fire, in much the same way. He is said to have only reluctantly snuffed out candles. Respect for the natural world has so grown in the last few decades that all this makes Francis look a bit like an environmentalist avant la lettre. And in fact, Pope John Paul II proclaimed him the patron saint of the environmental movement. Although Francis was no friend of scientific inquiry and had no use for secular books and knowledge, it has been suggested that his attitude toward the world in fact helped encourage the study of it. I'm not so sure about this, but certainly many later Franciscans, especially in England, became known for their scientific interest, including Roger Bacon, Adam Marsh, and Robert Grosstest. This is the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi as it looks today. Francis made his followers promise that after his death they would continue his lifestyle, not become capitalists, take only enough in donations to get through the day, use only abandoned churches and so on. But he was hardly through the pearly gates before Brother Elias of Cortona, who became the head of the order, began the construction of this monumental church in his honor and in the crypt of which he's now buried. Elias himself was later removed from office for what were considered his abuses of the Franciscan ideal, but he was made ambassador to Constantinople then by the Emperor Frederick II, about whom we'll hear next time, a position to which his talents seemed better suited than they were to running a monastic order. We're not going to hear in any detail about the history of the Franciscan order, it has undergone many changes and suffered many of the same problems that have affected other orders, but it has had more than its share of effective leaders, and today it is the largest of all such organizations. This is the facade of the basilica now. Brother Elias may have in fact been the architect of this church, while others give a German fellow called Jacopo d'Alemagna the credit. The fact that it is another of the buildings called the First Gothic Church in Italy does suggest, perhaps at least, the participation of a northern architect. 
The only things about the facade, however, that really look at all gothic are the doorway and the rose window. Otherwise, it's about as generic as any building facade could be. Okay, that's where we'll wind up this lecture. Next time, we'll go inside and hear about some of the first great painters of the Renaissance, like Cimabue and Giotto. And we'll hear, among other things, about the Emperor Frederick II, Stupor Mundi, the wonder of the world, with whom St. Francis corresponded on the subject of birds. The emperor liked birds too, but he didn't think they were his brothers and sisters. <laughs>